how grateful I am that uh, your pastor has uh, given me an invitation to be here at Mount Zion. My wife and I actually came through here uh, last year on our way to Ohio. I was preaching there for about three meetings and we uh, wanted to uh, be a part of the church here for uh, that time and so we dropped in and, and uh, dropped out. And I didn't know if I'd ever get to come back or not, but uh, that day was a great day your pastor preached, and we enjoyed uh, being with you that day. Uh, as your pastor said, uh, just a little bit of information about myself to know who I am. For five months, short of 50 years, I was a pastor of five Baptist churches. The last one was the church that my dad had pastored for 30 years, and upon his retirement, the church uh, called me to come and follow him. We didn't change locks even. We uh, kept the same locks on the church. And for 33 years, uh, I pastored the church. The last uh, 30 months of my pastorate there, I co-pastored with a young man, uh, Brother Zach Hatton, uh, for the 30-month period of transition and after that, uh, he has now become my pastor. After I retired uh, from being a pastor, I said to my wife, uh, I need to write a book on Baptist. And uh, she, she denies this, but I have a memory of this. She said, you better get with it. Now that's code for you're getting old, dude. And uh, she denies that. She simply said, I meant that you needed to focus your attention. You needed to invest your time. And, and uh, I still don't believe her. I, I still think she was uh, telling me that I was uh, living on borrowed time. And so uh, for the first uh, year plus of retirement, I uh, began to write and research uh, what I had believed and what I had been taught about what it means to be a Baptist, and I wrote this book entitled, Still a Baptist, Neither Angry Nor Ashamed of It. It's uh, 317 pages long, and there is uh, 111 sources, a, a bibliography in the back of the book that I put together, as well as uh, 263 footnotes to uh, let you know what the historical position of me of, of a Baptist is. I really uh, didn't write, this is the first book that I wrote in several that I've written that I did not write to preach. It was a research book, it was a legacy book that I wanted to pass on and I never thought that somehow that this would be a, a series that I would preach. It's uh, called a seminar. I hope that that doesn't turn you off. Uh, a seminar uh, is really, uh, let's see if I can, it's a meeting for discussion and training. And, uh, but there is this caveat, preaching's going to break out along the way because I'm very passionate about the idea that you and I need to know what it means to be a Baptist. And we need to know why we believe what we believe. And we need to be able to defend that. And so I've got really some very simple goals in mind for this week with you. Uh, it is simply that we would... Uh, I, I'm clicking and it will take a while, I understand, uh, that we'll, we'll see if we can move along here. Technology is great. There it is. Here we go. Number one, we're going to examine the New Testament and see what the pattern of the church is in the New Testament. That is, we're going to be able to see if this church replicates the churches of the New Testament. So we're going to be looking at the Bible and the references in Scripture about what a church should be. Also, with that, hopefully we're going to be able to equip you with some Bible truth that's going to help you know why you are what you are. And if you're not what you are, that is, if you're not a Baptist, hopefully today we'll begin to move you along on that track for you to consider why it's very important for you to be a Baptist. And then thirdly, by the nature of this seminar, 
there will be things exposed, and I hope that you don't take them that I'm attacking anyone. I'm just telling you that there is a difference about being a Baptist and being something else. And so uh, there will be some of that involved in that because things are very different. Simply because people go to a church building that has a church un by name underneath it, uh, you need to know why we are what we are. And then fourthly, I, I want to encourage you to remain faithful to God. And I, how can I say that hasn't been going on now for more than 100 years in Mount Zion? So uh, you're now the generation to carry this on. And uh, some of you look like uh, you're, uh, you're up to it. And so we're going to look at uh, God's Word today. I want to just begin today by asking you to turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. This is one of three prayers that are included in the book of Ephesians. There are 650 prayers in the Bible. Now that would be an interesting study, and I'm not going to do that today, and God's people said amen. amen. This prayer begins in chapter 3 and verse 14, and we could read through it and we would profit by that, but today I want to look at the concluding verse, which is really one of the key verses in the Bible about the church. Ephesians 3 verse 21. Ephesians 3.21 says, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Now let's personalize that, if you will. When we come to that phrase, in the church, let's say in Mount Zion Baptist Church. So let's read it together. And you're going to read it out loud with me, Okay. Here we go. Unto him be glory in Mount Zion Baptist Church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. I want to give you three things, and the first one's already on the screen for you today. This verse really divides itself so easily into these three parts. Now, if you've been around Baptist preachers any time, you know we always have three points. Some people have asked me about that. I said, well, it's about as high as we can count as preachers. And it's probably two more than you'll remember. But I'm hoping today that I can wrap this up in such a way that you'll be able to remember these three points out of this one verse today that will help you see what God wants you to know about your life as a believer in Jesus Christ. It begins with a purpose statement. It says this, Unto Him, that's God the Father, unto Him be glory. And so what is the purpose for our lives? People are looking for purpose. Uh, uh, one, one preacher made millions of dollars on the purpose-driven life. Well, here's the purpose. Unto Him be glory. That tells us that here, right now, life here... And eternity later is about glorifying God. Amen. You can find that so easily in the Bible that the, the purpose that we have in life is not for ourselves, but for the one who created us and potentially the one who saves us. Now there are three aspects of the glory of God. And let me just point those out to you. So uh, easily today. First of all, that's not the first one. We already, there you go, intrinsic. First of all is the intrinsic glory of God. That may not be a familiar word to you, but it's a, really a, a regular word. We're going to use your, your clicker. Is that what we're going to do? Uh, if you'll look at this, it's the same as mine. But uh, Jedediah will override and we will start using this one. Evidently, he was clicking it back in the back. Let's talk about intrinsic glory. What does that mean, intrinsic glory? Well, the intrinsic glory of God is the, the glory God has already. 
we actually do not add to God's glory. And, and factually, we cannot give God glory because God has all the glory already. He is glorious in love. He is glorious in holiness. He is glorious in mercy. He's glorious in grace. He is all glorious. That's who God is. And someone asked, well, where was God before the world was? Well, he was in his glory. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 17. You see, God is called the God of glory and the Father of glory. Jesus is called the, the, the Lord of glory and the King of glory. And the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of glory. And so God is all glory, intrinsically he is glorious. And then also, there is the manifested glory of God. You remember these times in the Bible when God showed up? You remember after uh, the, uh, the ark landed and the waters dried out, God gave a rainbow. That was a manifestation of God's glory to the people that there would never be another universal flood. When they built the, the tabernacle, there was a manifestation of the glory of God. And when God had the temple built by Solomon, there was a manifestation of the glory of God. You know what's missing in churches today? The manifestation of the glory of God. Now, I don't mean by that that you and I need to have a cloud over our building or some kind of rainbow identifying some spirit of God on our lives. What you and I need to do is we need to realize that God is already here and we need to make sure that he is free to do whatever he wants to do. And I pray for God to manifest himself in our lives even this week. But what we're talking about in Ephesians 3 and verse 21 is the ascribed glory of God. The ascribed glory of God. And that simply means you and I recognize who God is and give him praise. We don't add anything to God. We simply recognize that God is who He is. He is intrinsically glorious. We acknowledge that. We praise that. We submit to that. Somebody says, well, I, I, I'm not just, my life's just kind of boring right now. I'm, I'm having a tough life. I, I don't have any joy in my life. I can't seem to find out what to do in my life. Well, start glorifying God. Give glory to God. And the Bible identifies the purpose that we have. Now, if we succeed in everything else and fail to give God glory, we've not really reached our potential. Amen. This verse tells us the purpose that we have in life. It also tells us about a person. Unto him be glory by Christ Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, there's only one star in God's celestial kingdom that we're to celebrate forever, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the theme of what life is all about. You see, back in that idea of giving glory to God, we had all fallen short of the glory of God. And there was no way that we could actually do what we should do, and that is to know God and to worship God and to serve God unless God initiated a plan by which he would meet the need that we could be restored to him. And that was all done in the person of Jesus Christ. He, is, he came to the world here to, to be our Savior and Lord. And I'm glad today that I can point you to him today as the, the real hope. You see, some people say, well, I, I know that I know that Jesus is special. Uh, I know that he's even uh, significant. Well, do you know that he's singular? Do you know that there's no one else like him? He is the, the bright and morning star. I hope that you know him today. I try to tell as many people as I can that Jesus Christ is not a good way to salvation in heaven and Jesus Christ isn't the best way to salvation in heaven Jesus is the only way to salvation in heaven 
I've, uh, I've preached a lot of funerals. When you stay around a place, everybody knows you, and even your church folks who are not church folks, they want you to do your funeral for them. And I, I, I repeat this over and over again wherever I go because we've gotten so politically correct and, and we've gotten uh, so the idea that, well, every religion has their positive things. Ladies and gentlemen, there's only one faith that will forgive you and there's only one faith that will take you to heaven and that is faith in Jesus Christ. It is by Christ Jesus that we bring glory to God. Now it's possible for you today to have a saved life. You can be born again today. The Bible tells us that what know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which you have of God and you're not your own you've been bought with a price therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's you can be saved today if you're not saved and you you, you have this understanding in your heart that you're not prepared to to go out into eternity you're you're you know I, I think about it all the time it, at 75 now are you kidding I better be thinking about it and I better really know as many people that I can to share with them that they can know for sure that when they step out of this life, they're going to step into the presence of God. Amen. You can be born again today. Christ did everything necessary for you to have your sins forgiven when he died for you and shed his blood. And what wonderful songs we've sung today that, that have reminded us over and over again that, that you and I can, can, can have a a life that's been saved by Jesus Christ. I wonder though, are you living a uh, Christ-connected life? I mean, is your life really connected? I know, I know positionally in Christ what we are, but I'm wondering how centered you are in Jesus today. Well, how do you, how do you become that? How do you get more of of, of Christ being in your life and on your life so that you can have greater opportunity to bring glory to Christ. Well, this verse tells us this. I left out the reading of that, but here's what it is. Look at it in, in this passage here, verse 21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. Throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. You see... Uh, you, you can't bring glory to God by Christ Jesus and neglect the church. And I say that in the slide overhead, that the church is both a place and a people. And for a Christian, you're going to need a church life in order to bring glory to God by Christ Jesus. Let me say it this way and let you understand this. The church is a place. It's a local, visible place. Now, it's not the building. You're, something could tragically happen to this building, either burn up or blowed up or, or blown over, and you'd still be the church here. But I'm talking about that this is a congregation in a place. It's always identified that in the Bible as a, a local, visible place body, not a universal invisible. It's also a, a, a people. I'm willing to wait, are you? Let's see if I can, there it is, all right. We're an assembly, we're a local assembly of, of God's people here. And those people are, are baptized people. And those people are baptized people who have joined themselves together in that one place among those people in order to worship and grow and reach the lost with the gospel. Are there any of those kind of Christians here today? You can say amen if you want to. And if you don't say it, I'll pump it out of you in a minute. Just enjoy yourself. By the way, let me take a time out here. You may not be aware of this about that term amen and, and how the congregation responds to the preaching like that. Amen doesn't mean I agree with you. 
Amen means go to the next point. <laughs> what were you thinking all these years? Right? Amen. 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 <laughs> Even got the preacher excited now. We got revival going on today. What kind of believers do you read about in the New Testament? They were all local church believers. Now there was one exception, and that was the thief on the cross. And I say he's got a legitimate hang-up. Amen? All other believers in the Bible, they trusted Christ. They were baptized. They began assembling with the people of God. And corporately they begin to carry out the work of the Lord. And this verse says, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. That means now, throughout all ages. World without end, that's even into eternity. I don't know how God's going to do that. I'm not trying to be coy. I really don't know how God's going to collect all the different congregations and get glory through that. But if God said it, I believe it. I believe it's going to make a difference in your life to not only believe on the Lord to go to heaven, but I believe the kind of life you live once you're born again makes a difference to God. And it'll make a difference to you in eternity. Well, we got a problem, though. And you know the problem because you engage these people all the time. And the problem is there are a lot of Christians who are homeless. They're homeless. They don't have a church home. In the church I pastored, we would have, as in a, in a church that, that ran 120 to 140 regularly, we, we would have 25 to 30 people who loved our church but never made it their home. Isn't that amazing? That probably doesn't happen in Missouri, does it? Probably doesn't even happen today. I'm sure everybody here is a member of Mount Zion Baptist Church. That may not be true. I'm, I'm uh, just trying to ease up on you a little bit. But. You know, that's become generational now. That's become generational. Grandma and Grandpa didn't stay in a church or get in a church, and before you know it, now Mom and Dad aren't in a church, and now... The kids aren't in a church and they just float around from congregation to congregation as though they're, I don't know what they're thinking. God wants you to have a church home. He doesn't want you to be homeless. He wants you to be in a church. And I, this is really just introduction. This is not the real deal. The real deal starts tonight. And I'll start the seminar tonight. I just wanted to introduce you to how fundamental, how essential, how primary it is for you to get on this this church thing. I really wonder about people. Now, I'm not in charge of this. As far as going to heaven, I'm in the celebration committee. I'm not in the reservation committee. I don't don't choose who goes. I just kind of celebrate the fact that when we get there, I'm going to be happy. And matter of fact, I'm pretty happy right now about it. But you know, I worry about people who say they're going to heaven when they die, but they don't go to church when they're alive. Come on, amen to that. You better go on after that. Because there are a lot of people that say, well, you know, I'm, I'm saved, but they never get around to really identifying even regularly in weekly worship. What does that mean? Well, it may mean that uh, some people in the church need to trust Christ. You know, if Jesus had one out of 12 that weren't, that wasn't a believer, maybe you've been in a building like this and, and heard preaching and maybe you've been in Sunday school classes, but somehow it's, you've avoided the, the whole idea of the great need of trusting Christ. I wouldn't bring doubt on your mind at all. Once 
God saves somebody, he saves them. Amen. Begins to change their life. That's it. I, I've, been, I've been doing some other study, and I want to get off in that, because that's what happens to preachers. They start studying something that just overwhelms them. But what's needed today in our evangelism is not just confrontational evangelism. We need transformational evangelists. That is, our lives need to be transformed in such a way that, that people see a difference that God has brought about in our life. And the reason there's not a difference in some people's lives is because they haven't been saved. Amen. The maniac of Gadara. The new dude in a rude mood. Freaking folks out. Meets Jesus is demons are cast out of him. The next time he shows up, he's wearing clothes. How about an amen for clothes? Amen. He's wearing clothes and he's sitting calmly and he's being instructed by Jesus. Amen. And he wants to go home. He wants to go with Jesus. He wants to go on tour with Jesus. You know what Jesus told him? Nope, you can't go. And without a seminar, without a class... Jesus sends that man back to Decapolis and the next time Jesus comes back there's a positive crowd that wants to hear about Jesus. What's that all about? It's about a transformed evangelist. Amen. And may God transform our lives. May God's spirit get a hold of our lives to give us a, a burden and a change. And I believe that that would, that would really make a difference in in a lot of people's lives. They're looking for something to, to change them. And I believe Jesus can. Amen. Some people need to be saved. There are other people who are saved, but they never really openly profess their faith in Christ by baptism. Now, baptism is something that the church does in behalf of those that believe. But we don't, we don't believe in generic baptism. We're, we're just going about randomly baptizing believers. We believe those believers who are baptized are placed into the church under the responsibility of the church. And I'm amazed that, that some people who've been in church a long time still haven't been baptized. It's such a remarkable thing... Uh, the other day I saw that uh, Southern Baptist churches were having a baptism Sunday. Isn't that a mark? There, there ought to be regular baptism days in Baptist churches. But what they were just simply saying is they, they found that their churches were being attended regularly by people who've never been baptized. I'm going to talk to you about that this week, about what baptism is in the Bible and how it was replicated by congregations down through all the ages. That's how we got our identity. And I would encourage you this week, if you've not been baptized, some of you young people who, who may have been saved, but you've been really concerned about uh, you know, presenting yourself or going down front or talking to the pastor about being baptized. I was, I was saved on January the 1st, 1956, as a 10-year-old boy on a Sunday night, service January 1st. That's a holiday weekend. Aren't you glad a church met on Sunday night on a holiday? And I got saved that night and they were having baptism that night. And so within 15 minutes of being saved, I was baptized. I became a Baptist. But I've never confused the two. I never have thought that, well, getting wet made me saved and going to heaven. No, trusting Christ does that. But baptism is so important and and maybe even if you're kind of trying to figure this out, that, that you'll begin to come to these uh, special services beginning tonight at 6 and, and uh, get what the Bible says. It's not my opinion. It's not your pastor's opinion. It's what the Bible says. And then there, there would probably be some who attend a Baptist church like this that, uh, that need to transfer their membership. And, uh, you know... Baptists have a lot of ways of having members. They, you know, they, they need to be baptized. They can transfer their membership. Uh, I, I don't want to get into all the weeds here, you know, and try to cut my way out of them.
But the main thing is, if you've been saved and scripturally baptized by another church, it doesn't mean you need to be rebaptized. It means you can write, or the church can write for a transfer of a letter. I, 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 your church has figured that out, and they'll be able to do that, and they'll be able to help you on that. You know what I'm finding is when I talk to people, they get all emotional about some baptism and membership they have in a church that's 400 miles away. You know, Grandma is buried in the old cemetery there, and we just can't move our membership to where we're going. You know what I say to those people? Dig Grandma up and come on, we'll find a place in the parking lot for her, right? Some, pl some plant or something, I don't know. We'll, find, we'll make an urn out here for her, Grandma's urn. Now, my wife does, doesn't like when I say that. I, I've, re I've repeated this, and, and she still doesn't like it. I'm glad she's not here. She had to give, be giving me this. You need to show a little more class than that. I've been, I've been out of class in high school more than I was in class. Hey, I know this. With regard to church life, every member needs to step up their involvement. I tell you what's happened in COVID. I, I had about six appointments of preaching these meetings. This is the 25th of these kind of seminars that I've already done since 2018. And God's kind of plugging me in here and there. But what's happened in COVID is everybody's got a little casual. Now, I don't mean this church, but I mean churches like this one. And, you know, sometimes they don't want to come to the assembly now because we don't have anything for the children. Hey, church is for children. Amen. Church is for children. I was raised up in the age of where that was church. You went with your family. And we didn't have all the other. Now, I'm not against all those other things, but, folks, we just need to get back in the routine of serving God and doing what we can and doing more than maybe we have done. And that may mean some of you need to step up and say, hey, I'll volunteer to, to teach a Sunday school class when we get started back. And I'll get, I'll get in the choir. Now, I don't, know about, I don't know about some of you. I didn't listen to your audition today. You know who you are, right? And if you don't know who you are, the person sitting next to you know who you are. Pray while they sing. <laughs> hey, there's something you can do in church. God doesn't put you in a church to do nothing. I'm so thankful. We have had so many faithful people in our church that have served in various capacities whether it's the sound guy and, and, and just because this is slow doesn't mean he is. I don't know him yet, but Aaron, we will get to know each other this week, all right? I always get to know these guys by name because we will have an issue before the week's over. <laughs> There's so many good people doing a lot of good stuff, but almost in every church that I've ever been a part of, there are some people that are coasting. I hope that doesn't offend you, but I hope it convicts you. That there's something you can do. There's something that you can do. Think about it. You have wonderful facilities here. These do not maintain themselves without somebody looking in on them and having an interest in them. Uh, the yard needs to be mowed from time to time. And the building needs to be painted and... And there are children that need being ministered to. And there are youth groups that need to be raised up. And, and all of us can do something. And most of us can do more than what we've been doing. And when I stepped down from being a pastor at the age of 71, a lot of people had the idea that I was going to hit the recliner and find the TV remote. I thought, well, that's not the way I'm going to finish out my life. I'm going to finish my life out doing whatever God wants me to do. I'm going to write, I'm going to write books. I've just written a new book. 
It's entitled, Who Didn't See This Coming? The Continuing Consequences of the Sexual Revolution of the 1960s. It's the biggest book I've ever written. 385 pages, highly researched. It's telling you why we're in the mess we're in. Now, I've, I've invested over a year in this book. I invested a, another year in the last book. And I'm already starting on another book. And, and in order to make me dig out of this deep depression about all the ugly stuff that goes on in people's lives is I'm researching and writing a book now on heaven. Amen. Because I'm fixing to go there. And I can't wait. There's something you can do. In Moses' day, he had a couple of Aaron and hers and just lifted up his hands. You can pray. There were people in Paul's lives that financed some of his work from time to time and he said, I'll never forget those people. You can give. Now God's blessed my wife and I to get prepared for this time that called retirement. I don't know what to call it. They've refired me. They've reignited me. But we've gotten ready to do this, and we're we're finding that God is putting into our lives finances for us to just give away. And some of you who who've reached this golden era of a retirement, you you've financially gotten ready for it. Let me give you a clue. The the happiest thing you can do is give it away. Give it away. Look for a cause. Invest in something that's going to outlive your life. I'm not telling you to sell your RV. Do whatever you want to about that. But folks, if God's given you resources, use them for His glory. Invest in things that are eternal. So I conclude today. How about an amen for the conclusion? We all need a Christ-centered life. And we need a church-connected life. And there are only two questions you're probably going to face when you face God. Did you live a Christ-centered life? And did you have a church-connected life? I believe if you get those two right, (laughs) everything else is going to fall into place. You're going to be able to navigate through all kinds of things that are going to come up that you never anticipated if Christ is at the center of your life and church is connected to your life. Back in the day before Sonogram, my wife was uh, 19. And she was having our first child. This is before my sonogram, so you didn't know if it was a boy or a girl or what. We figured out it was going to be one or the other. And she was in labor for about 15 or 16 hours, not able to have her little baby. And finally the doctor came out. And uh, interesting enough, this was when the flu was rampant back in 19 and 68 and uh, my parents had both had it my dad came her parents weren't there finally my dad had to leave to get ready for church and the doctor came out and said to me Mr. Locke uh, we're going to have to take this baby by cesarean section and uh, it'll, it'll, it'll won't take very long I'll be back out it could be serious but we'll let you know I remember getting on my knees in Bethania Hospital, cold, hard floor. And I bowed my knee before God and I said, God, if you'd protect my wife and whatever baby, whoever this little baby is, I promise you we're going to raise this baby to, to know you and to serve you. I got up no sooner had I prayed like that. And the doctor came back in and said, uh, Mr. Locke, you're the proud father of a baby boy. Man, he looked like an old man. He had been trying to fight to get into life, and he had failed, but there he was. They were holding him up. You remember, you remember when they held you up at, at the window? Come on now. You remember? You didn't even, all this kind of, here, let me take a picture. No, no, woo. Not at all. It was like, hold the little baby up. That was my first vision of my boy. He roughed up big time. Well, 
led that little boy to the Lord. He was a, I was the first man that he put his hand to me at the age of 19, said, God's called me to preach, and I'm preaching. That boy that I prayed for is into his 21st year of being a pastor at the same church in East Texas. Had a daughter two years later. She leads our Wednesday night kids' children's program. Best place for you to raise your children's in church. You'll have no regrets about that. And some of you parents need to get a hold of yourselves right now or you're going to lose your children. Because they see your lack of priority. And if you don't have a priority for a Christ-centered and church-connected life, don't think they will. It's too much to pay. It's, It's too big a price. And I'm praying today that God will use this seminar to... uh, Refocus your life. And for you to understand what a privilege it is to be saved. Amen. Amen. And to be in a good Bible preaching Baptist church. Amen. Stand with me for prayer, please. Father, thank you today for the privilege to be your preacher in this moment. I pray that you'll bless. I I just, uh, I have a burden today, Lord, that you put on my heart. That somehow we would move beyond just the formality of church. And press in into the presence of uh, your, your divine presence in such a way that we would seek your face and, and, uh, Find a place of repentance in our life for our casualness. And dear God, also that we would uh, surrender ourselves to you to be your servants. Thank you for the day of gathering of your people today. Moving freely among your people today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.